Isn't it amazing that we can, as we sang in the, in the hymn together just a moment ago as we worshipped, we can praise God Most High, that God wants us to praise him. He wants us to bring our praises to him this morning. He wants to spend time with us this morning. He wants to have fellowship with us this morning. The God who created the world, the God who's just so incredibly awesome, wants to spend time with each one of us today. Now, I want to thank God for that, because that's pretty amazing, isn't it, that God wants to spend time with us today. And let's speak to him now and ask that he'll bless what I say. Father God, I thank you that you want to be here with us. I thank you that you are here with us. I thank you that you're here with us, and when we worship you, it brings joy to your heart. Father God, help us now as we listen to what you've got to say, to hear the words that you want to say. Help me to speak the words in the right way and say the right things. Amen. I want to um, start by just reading a proverb to you. It's in Proverbs 16, verse 2, and it says, All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but his motives are weighed by the Lord. Repeat that again. All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but his motives are weighed by the Lord. I want to talk a bit this morning about what motivates you and what we look for in different forms of motivation. Now, hopefully coming up behind me in a minute is going to be perhaps... I don't know, does anybody recognise um, this person? Does this person motivate you? His, perhaps he should. There's a clue in his name. His name is Derek Errol Evans. He's best known, though, by his pseudonym, which is Mr Motivator. Mr Motivator, in the 1980s, and thanks to the internet I just found out, come back this year... His job was dressing in lycra of a variety of different shades and endless enthusiasm to motivate us to exercise. That's what he wants us to do. His job every morning was to motivate us to perhaps put aside our cornflakes or our porridge or our toast, or perhaps all three of them, um, to put those aside for the morning and to, to do some exercises instead. He motivates me to get up from my chair and switch the television off. But we get motivated in different ways, doesn't he? He clearly gets some people going. Perhaps he's not aimed at me. Perhaps I'm not his core audience. And we're going to talk a little bit about motivation this morning, but we're not going to talk about Mr Motivator for any longer than that. So thank you, Graham. Today, in John's Gospel, we find this story of Jesus clearing the temple. And in John's Gospel, it comes very much at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In fact, he's just changed water into wine. It's first miracle. And John records this event, a Passover time, as right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The other three Gospels record a similar event in, in, in the Holy Week, in the last week of Jesus' life, when he clears the temple. Now, there's different views on this. Some, some, some biblical scholars say that actually John's put it there for theological reasons to actually make his point. Other biblical scholars claim that actually that Jesus did this on a couple of occasions. I don't want to go too much into that because I don't think that's what we're here for this morning and that's not what God wants to talk to us about. But the whole point is here is Jesus, according to John, right at the beginning of his ministry. And he's going to Jerusalem for the Passover. His reaction in what we read seemed, I think fairly extreme on the first account. He's angry, isn't he? He's clearly angry. He makes a whip out of cords and drives all the people from the... drives all from the temple area, both the sheep and the cattle. He scatters the money changers' money and he says, get out of here, how dare you turn my father's house into a market. He goes in there and he upsets what's going on at the moment. But why was Jesus so angry? Why was Jesus so full of rage at what had been going on? You see, I don't think it actually, when you look at it, I don't think it was the fact that they were selling the animals. Stick with it. People came at this time to make sacrifices. They needed an animal that was without blemish. They, some of them had travelled a very long way. And actually, it says in Deuteronomy 14, actually, it kind of advises people at the time that it was quite a good idea to buy an animal nearby if you'd come a long distance. So the people that were selling him the animals, on first appearances, were actually doing something quite good because they were enabling people to come and make their sacrifices to God and make their sacrifices in the right way. So on first appearances, 
what they were doing perhaps didn't seem quite as re- um, unreasonable as we might appear. Also, the tithe that they needed to pay, they needed to pay a tithe that needed to be paid in the temple shekel. They didn't want the pagan coins that they were coming along. So these guys who were money changers were there to provide a service so that people could pay their tithe, which was surely a good thing. So on, if we look at it on those terms, Jesus actually was being a fairly unreasonable, we could say. But I don't think that's the case. Jesus wasn't unreasonable. See, what Jesus saw, he saw beyond what they appeared to be doing, and he saw their motive. He saw what motivated them. He saw that they were doing things in his name, but their motives weren't to bring glory to his name. Reading around, at the t- reading around our cats at the time, it appeared that the only animal, the animals were only available from the temple at the time, and the only an animal, as I said, um, that could be sacrificed was without blemish. And in order for an animal to be um, seen as without blemish, it had to be certified. And uh, accounts of the time say that it was actually could only be certified by one of the people in the temple. And they were the same people that sold the animals. So therefore, if you came along with an animal that wasn't without blemish, that, sorry, that, that came along for an animal you didn't buy from them, the chances were that they weren't going to allow you to do that. So they were selling you an animal because you didn't have any other choice. These animals could be bought at large costs. They'd say that they weren't really motivated by bringing glory to God. They were motivated by their greed. They were motivated by their own needs. The money changers were also exchanging things at very favorable exchange rates for themselves, which is quite unlike most money changers today, isn't it? Um, Alfred Edersheim, a Jewish historian and cultural expert, says at this time in history, the priests were netting an equivalent of $300,000 a year in this money exchange alone. They weren't doing this because they wanted to bring glory to God. They were doing this because they wanted to bring money to their pockets. You see, I think Jesus' reaction here is he saw what they did, but more important than that, he saw their motives. They were distorting what God had planned and taking it to suit their own needs. Jesus looks at our motives. He looks at what we do, but he looks at our hearts. And he looks at our hearts this morning. He says... What motivates you to do what you do? Is it to bring glory to God? What motivates you? I want to talk about a couple of other people now who perhaps um, I looked up motivational speakers on um, the internet. It's great. Where where, where did people, when people spoke in churches before the internet, I don't know where they got their ideas from. But anyway, um, I looked up motivational speakers and they get their resources from, I should mean, not their ideas. Um, I I looked up various motivational speakers and this first one that's coming up, hopefully in the second row, this this was a motivational speaker that comes up. Um, Anybody know who this this, 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 um, motivational speaker is? Any ideas? This this is, uh, yes, this is a 15-year-old Tom Daly. Okay, now Tom Daly, in case you don't know, he is a, um, he's a diver, isn't he? He was, in the, he was in the Olympics and there was lots of press coverage about Tom Daly. Now the great thing about this particular site about motivational speakers, and don't worry, I haven't booked one, is next to their names are uh, uh, little pound signs to tell you how much they cost. Um, he wasn't the cheapest, okay? He, you know, he wasn't, he was, quite, he was quite expensive actually. He had two pound signs next to his name, which means more than two pounds, I have to say. But it showed you what price bracket he was in. And anyway, this is what Tom Daly says that he does. He looks back at his successes so far, and he's beginning to realise what is meant and what his phenomenal talent is set to bring in the future. Tom has achieved great successes at senior level at an early age, which has brought vast media experience both in the UK and abroad. He is considered a medal prospect for the 2012 Olympic Games in London, and as one of the British Olympians being tracked through the years, leading up to 2012 by the British television series Olympic Dreams. This is the thing that you should read this and think, oh, we want to get... Now, I'm sure he's got incredibly interesting things to say. I'm sure he's got lots of really interesting experiences, but, do you know, I'm not sure that that he'd motivate me. Um, I'm not too sure about that. I'm not sure whether it will work, but I'm sure it works for lots of people. I'm sure it does work for lots of people, but I don't think it motivates me. The next person whose motivation coming up here, um, 
unfortunately, they're playing today, not yesterday. And because if obviously if they'd lost yesterday, it would have been a much more meaningful um, visual clue. Um, let's just assume they're going to lose this afternoon. And um, this is Martin Johnson, the England rugby captain, uh, England rugby coach. As England rugby captain, he was incredibly successful and was renowned for his motivational skills. Um, his motivational technique was he'd get everybody going quite well, and, and a man, he's quite a big guy, and he might motivate me. He might motivate me out of fear, it has to be said. Um, he might motivate me out of a little bit worried that he might get a little bit cross with me. But he's also a motivational speaker, and I, I imagine it would be very interesting to listen to, very interesting to listen to these sorts of things. But I'm not sure they work for me. I'm not sure either of these people get, would get me motivated. And I don't think, you know, out of fear or out, out of envy, perhaps, for the young lad who's so successful, they're not the things that should be motivating us. So, thanks, Ren. Or I then thought, OK, what about um, other ideas about how we can get motivated? And I, and, I, and I looked up some self-help motivational books, OK? Um, there was a great book called um, Cappuccino and Success, which kind of says quite a bit about the time, I think, that it was written in. And it, it says it's got 101 motivational stories. Um, these are some of the things that it promises to do if you read these stories. No, these are some of the things it claims it can do. It says it can get you out of your comfort zone as so as to demand more out of life if you read these stories. It enables you to take control of your emotions, attitudes, behaviour and action and it enables you to achieve outstanding results. Your inspirational reading of this motivational book will make you appreciate your loved ones and have better lasting relationships. This is what it says. I like this one. It achieves financial breakthrough, which is incredibly ironic currently at the time. Perhaps the world leaders could have read that yesterday. Um, and it also allows you to relax and get rid of stress and worries. And this, this is the book, Success, um, Cappuccino Success. I've not read the whole book, but these are the things that there are books out there that are claiming to be able to do. I'm not sure that's what I want, really, in motivating me. If we look a little bit later in the passage, after Jesus has got so angry at these people's motivations, at what makes them behave the way that they do, if we look a little bit later in the passage, we see what motivated Jesus. They said to him, the Jews demanded of him after he'd done this, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. That was Jesus' motivation. That's what motivated him to do, him to do what he did. He came with the intention of destroying the temple, which was his body, and raising again in three days so that we could have a relationship with him. And this is what we celebrate this morning as we come to communion. We celebrate what Jesus' motivation was because he wanted to have that relationship with us. No, change that. He wants to have that relationship with us. So much that he was prepared, he was motivated to do that. He wants that relationship. Jesus looks into our hearts this morning in the same way as he did to those people in the temple. He looks at what we do but he looks at our motivations. He looks at why we do what we do. What drives us? What makes us do what we do? Is it our own selfish motives? Is it we do things for us? Do we do things because they're the best for us and we want to get the best out of it? You know, they might appear quite good. They might appear quite good on the outside. As it says... In the, as I read in Proverbs at the beginning, all a man's ways seem innocent to him, but his motives are weighed by the Lord. If the Lord weighs our motives this morning, are we doing things for him? Is that our prime focus? Is that our prime aim? Is that our motivation? Because that's what God wants it to be. That's what God wants us to do. To conclude, in Philippians, I think he sums it up quite well. Philippians 2, verses 1 to 4. He says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in purpose, one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition 
or vain conceits, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's a real challenge this morning. And that's the challenge that God laid on my heart to share with you. To ask yourself, because he's asking this morning, and I can't answer this question in the, in the, in the way that I, perhaps I'd like to. He says, do, do I do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit? Do I in humility consider other be- others better than myself? Do you? Do I look not only for my own interests, but for the interests of others? Jesus has come here this morning, and he's asking you the question, what motivates you? What are your motives? Are they his motives? If they are, fantastic, praise God. If they're not, if they're not, he asks us to think very carefully and to spend time with him and to put his motives at the forefront of what we want to do. Amen.